All right. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome to TELUS Science Museum's Lunch and Learn today. Um, we want to first tell you about uh, some of our upcoming events that we have. This week is Spooky Week, so if you come by the museum, you'll see our decorations that we've got up um, for for the week. Um, and come in a costume if you want. That would be great. We've got lots of people walking around in costumes, both employees and guests. Um, next week on Friday evening, we have opening of our latest temporary exhibit, Out of This World. Um, the preview will be a be online, and it'll be a Facebook Live event at 7 p.m. Um, and then Saturday, the is the Solar Sky Watch. The, that's the following day, November 7th. Um, so we'll have the the telescopes up, and we'll be looking at the sun um, safely, of course. And then that also is the Bank of America weekend. So come if you're a Bank of America card holder, come with your ID and card, and you get in for free that weekend. Um, and then on November 11th, we have our Ask the Ex Expert event at 2 p.m. Um, with Bob Gossman, and we're going to be talking about solar energy. And today at our Lunch and Learn, we're talking about a cicada emerging in, from, in Opal. And we've got Brian T. Berger here, um, graduate gemologist, um, owner of the Velvet Box Society. Um, he's also the owner of the specimen that we actually have here at TELUS on exhibit. So he's he and his colleagues are going to tell us about that specimen, um, and that includes Dr. Boris Chauvire um, from the University of Grenoble Alps in France, and Mikhail Huadria, um, Dr. Mikhail Huadria from the Institute of Entomology in Branisovska, um, Czech, Czech Republic. Um, and we're going to um, jump over to Brian, and I think you're going to tell us about getting Beverly and, and a few other things. For sure. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I'm, I'm extremely honored uh, to be given the opportunity to, number one, display Beverly, the bug, uh, and share its uniqueness with the public. Uh, first, I want to express my gratitude uh, to everyone at the Telescience Museum. Um, if you guys don't know, they're a great museum in uh, just outside of Atlanta in Georgia. Um, and in, they've been incredible to work with, uh, great people. Uh, they were able to put this all together with uh, such speed and accuracy and efficiency. I really appreciate um, all of your hard work and particularly you, Ryan and uh, Jason and everyone else who uh, was able to put this all together so fast and, um, you know, get get her in there. And I'm sorry to have uh, bugged you with this for lack of a better way to put it. <laughs> um, my name is Brian Berger. I'm a graduate gemologist. Uh, in the Philadelphia area. Um, my company is at Velvet Box Society. Um, I've earned some special awards in gemology, uh, both uh, in the field and, you know, obviously um, for having some unique specimens such as this one, such as Beverly. Um, additionally, I'd like to thank Boris and Mikkel, uh, who are absolutely outstanding scientists. Uh, I can't speak highly enough of them. If you have questions in entomology or, you know, geology, gemology, Boris and Mikhail are some of the top scientists in the world, and it was a pleasure to work with them. And I really appreciate all that they've done to uh, to push this study forward and, you know, really create um, some knowledge behind uh, such a unique specimen. Um, I guess I first acquired the bug um, a few years ago, uh, and I, I guess in the in the area, I'm known for uh, purchasing, you know, sort of unique gems, uh, minerals, um, finished jewelry, you know, antique pieces, a little a little bit of everything. And um, the bug actually came to me from a uh, another dealer who had acquired the the purchase overseas, and then uh, sort of found me, and you know brought it to me and you know when I first heard about it I thought ah this can't be genuine but I always say let me take a look you know I'm always interested in you know unique specimens so I thought let me take a look and and um, you know let's let's take a look at the specimen and, and see what we have so upon examination I you know I thoroughly studied it under microscope and loop and uh, tested it and you know everything seemed genuine to me so then it came down to actually acquiring the piece, which I was very fortunate enough to be able to do. Um, you know, 
and I guess for me, you know, most of my background is not necessarily in uh, mineral specimens and minerals uh, themselves. So um, I'm more, you know, more into uh, polished gems. So it, though this wasn't my first experience, it was sort of a unique experience for me, um, but sort of the processes sort of carry over, you know, in that examination. And obviously with the top scientists in the world, Boris and Mikhail, it was such a great experience, like learning and using some of the best equipment in the world and really diving much deeper into, uh, you know, such a unique stone. And you can see, I think you guys have the, that specimen uh, displayed there. So you could see um, that's, a, that's a, a picture that I took, you know, right after I actually acquired it before we had any, uh, any concrete information on it. After I acquired it, uh, I guess my first step was figuring out what exactly it was. I mean, you know, I knew it was an opal. I knew it had an inclusion. I knew it was an insect inclusion, but I had no uh, no knowledge or um, expertise in in entomology, which is uh, obviously a challenge because we're crossing multiple domain domains here. It's not just gemology and geology anymore. We're you know we're looking at the entomology side. So um, I first started out by looking for a place that you know I could sort of pull together a team of you know leading scientists to figure out what you know what how it formed what the insect was or you know what happened so we could sort of tell the story a little bit better than um than you know here's a a, a one of one kind of specimen so um in doing so I you know I put a request out you know, to sort of find the right scientists. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of names uh, came into my email and came to me. And, you know, after reviewing everyone, all their uh, accolades and, and their just, just taking a look at the overall picture, it was such a, such a great thing to find Boris and Mikel and the rest of the team, quite frankly, um, who are some of the best scientists in the world for this this kind of um, this kind of study? I mean, it was a broad-based team, and uh, the team really I couldn't say enough good things about them and how they were able to you know study this on in each different channel that it needed to be studied and really bring forward uh, such incredible research to you know, the future of gemstones, the future of uh, entomology and the future of, you know, as Boris will probably tell you later, tracking, tracking life, which is, um, you know, something that uh, scientists all over the world have have been trying to do for for quite some time. So, you know, it was a real honor to work with them. And again, working with the TELUS Museum, great people. If you guys don't know, please, please go out and check out the TELUS Museum, uh, not just for Beverly, although she, in my opinion, she's an outstanding specimen, but the rest of the museum is um, absolutely incredible. So I, I really, uh, I really want to thank all of you guys for, um, you know, for, for your efforts. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Ryan, if you have questions, um, you tell me what, how you'd like to very good. Well, we're going to start well, here. Um, here. Awesome. We've got the um, um, paper that you guys wrote was um, the, and Boris was the lead author with Mikal and 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 you in that paper um, in um, Nature Research Scientific Reports. This was arthropod entombment in weathering formed opal new horizons for recording life in rocks. Um, and as the lead author in that paper, I want to see what Boris has to say about this um, specimen and the research that your team did together. There were seven authors total on the paper, including you three. Um, and start with Boris on what he, um, the what he, um, the vision he saw for this when he found out about Beverly, and then um, where this goes. Like you said, this research about understanding opal in life. So hi everyone and thank you for the invitations. 
first of all, uh, I was really honored to to work with uh, Michael, but we already know each other, and also with Brian and with uh, and to work on this uh, specific sample. Um, I saw the first pictures of uh, of the sample on the internet, so I contacted directly Brian, like uh, like he said, and uh, I was really honored uh, to to be chosen uh, for um, for these uh, investigations. So the first time we see the sample, it was really amazing because I'm I'm a specialist of Opal, and I, I have. Uh, I have so I have seen sorry um, a lot of things about Hopal with um, plant roots inside with a lot of things uh, as uh, inclusions, uh, especially mineral inclusions. And uh, here it was really um, amazing to see some things more complex than uh, plant roots. And uh, so yeah, it was really really amazing to to have the opportunity to to work uh, on these samples. Um, I don't know if you want to go deeper in the science part yet or not. Um, certainly, if you have some aspects that uh, about the opal that you want to share, we would love to um, see where your um, expertise as an opal expert um, it tells us more about this specimen. Oh yeah, uh, so yeah, I will share my screen if it's okay. Yep. Yes. Yep. And... So just to be, is everything okay? Do you see everything? Yes. Yeah, perfect. So uh, just to to just have a small reminder on the formations of opals. Uh, as you may say, on Earth and on Mars, the silicate, the surface is composed by silicates, like other minerals that you may know, like olivine, feldspar, and something like that. Uh, on Earth and on Mars, we know that there is some liquid water. On Earth, we observe that. Uh, uh, actually, uh, currently, mm -hmm. and on Earth we see that there is some geomorphological uh, evidence and mineralogical evidence of uh, water that have flowed on Mars uh, several uh, billion years ago. And when we put some uh, liquid water on this kind of silicates, you will have uh, reactions, we call it nitrolysis, and you release some silica. And this is this silica that will form the opal. To form the hopol, or how do we say hopolin silica, you can have abiotic precipitations or biomineralizations. This is the two main, uh, the two main pathways for the formations of hopolin silica. Uh, abiotic precipitations. If some of you have already go to Iceland, you may have seen this kind of stuff. It's uh, geysers, and uh, when the silica-rich water just cool down. Um, it will precipitate uh, has opaline silica. So here you have a kind of opal that is really specific of cases, and this is all silica here. And on Earth, we already we also have another way to have uh, opaline silica is the biomineralizations. Here it's diatoms, so it's it's um, <coughs> it's living in um, in salt water and also in uh, fresh water. You know, water. Yeah, and um, as we know yet, as, as we know on Earth, this is um, the main uh, way to uh, produce uh, opaline silica is by uh, biomineralizations. But on the only Earth or on Mars, we know that there is no, uh, no such life. So uh, all the opaline silica come from the abiotic precipitations. Um, we already know that we have opaline silica occurrences on Mars. We know that for more than 20 years ago now. Uh, and here I have put uh, put together a map with all the occurrence of opaline silica of Mars. Uh, so it's not exactly hopeful, it's all the opaline silica and hopeful, it's a part of an opaline silica. So it's a, it's a specific opaline silica. So you see that on Mars, we have a lot of occurrences on, uh, on Mars, and Hopalin Silica helped us to uh, reconstruct the aqueous history, so to know where and when uh, the water has flowed uh, on the surface of Mars. And uh, in addition, uh, Silica is also an astrobiological 
matrix uh, with the preservations of organic matter. Uh, with this sample, uh, before the sample, we already know that the silica is a good preservative uh, agent for the organic matter because the oldest uh, fossil we know on Earth are come from uh, this kind of, uh, of minerals. Um, just to go deeper on how the, the open silica preserve stress of life, uh, we have three main processes, and we will talk about only one here. And uh, we have the permineralizations and the replacements. So replacements, it's um, it's really simple. You just have uh, fossil; it's totally dissolved, and you replace all the materials with uh, with opal. And uh, for the permine the permineralizations, if you have uh, already see uh, opalized wood, it's exactly the, the same. This is the process is that leads to uh, opalized wood. And there is also the atonement. And here, in the case of these samples, we have a case of entombment. So we have a bug that is inside. Um, uh, an opaline silica. Uh, one of the uh, one of the good points of the atonement is uh, that we preserved all the all the organic matter and all the remains on uh, of the samples. Uh, but on Earth, we have observed atonement only on hydrothermal silica. So the silica that come from gases, uh, silica that come from other hydrothermal activities. Here you have. Uh, a small map with all the points of um, of uh, hydrothermal silica we <coughs> know on Earth. So you see that is really occasional on Earth. Uh, it's really specific at uh, some point. And uh, here we have uh, the first time with this sample, Beverly. We have the first time a uh, bug that is atomed in a weathering opal. So an opal that come from another way of precipitation, that is the red wing. And the red wing uh, is very interesting because um, uh, in the opposite of uh, hydrothermal opal, uh, red wing occur all the surface on Earth, and we know that it also occurs on the surface of Mars. So this sample is the first way to really explore how the opal that form during the red wing of rocks that can contain fossils. So it's really open a new way uh, for the research of life on Earth. Also uh, for like here in Indonesia or also on Mars when we know that a lot of the open silica we see on Mars come from uh, the red wing processes. Um, so this is very uh, just brief summary of um, of the um, of the of the paper, and this is what is the more interesting part for uh, for this uh, uh, this sample. So it's really open a new way to explore life, also on Earth, but also on Mars. Well, very very good. Thank you, Mikhail, uh, for showing us that. Um, the so the difference boring. there. Well, Boris, sorry, um, Boris. Um, <laughs> um, the so the big difference then is that this being weathered material that that the actual the rain and acids from meteoritical waters have taken out of material versus the the actual silica that's coming up through the heated water out of volcanic activity. Um, yeah. That's the big difference. And so Mars not being um, active in that way anymore. Um, maybe was in the past, we don't know. The only source then is any current flow of water or past flow of water in the, on the surface of Mars that then is being a source of potential opal. And does that tell us anything about light? Do we expect to be able to find life preserved on Mars that way? Or is it just going to tell us more about um, the past history of weather on Mars by having actual weathered opal? Oh, okay, both, both. Uh, now uh, we know that uh, silica and opal, in particular, is the most promising uh, target for uh, the preservation of potential Martian life. Uh, but also the presence of opal tells us that this is some kind of weathering of Mars because opal doesn't occur in all types of weathering. This is a specific weathering with specific physical and chemical conditions. Um, so this is really specific and with opaline silica we can have uh, both informations on the possible 
weather uh, or the interaction between the water and the surface and also on the possible um, life emergence on Mars. This is exciting um, science. So as you were looking at this opal, how were you able to distinguish that this was weathered opal and not hydrothermal opal? Because Indonesia it was a very tectonically active um, locality, and so you could have had hydrothermal water in that environment in the past. So how did you distinguish between that potential source and the actual source that you figured out this to be? Yeah, this is this is the excellent question. Uh, in Indonesia, we know that the um, the most productive opal uh, deposits come from the Red Wing. Uh, we know that uh, all the opal, we don't know in, in Indonesia uh, opal like uh, Beverly, like this kind of samples that come from uh, that come from hydrothermal. There is a lot of studies, uh, the geological studies on the opal deposits in uh, Indonesia, and this is typically weathering. Um, in my report, uh, at this point, I wanted to go exactly on this deposit to go further on the identifications on the processes, more specifically on the chemical and physical conditions that help to preserve this kind of life, and, uh, and not only uh, only uh, the, the formation of opal, but um, uh, now we know that in the in the area that the opal is found, we only found opals that come from the weathering of volcanic rocks. We know that there is no uh, no evidences of uh, hydrothermal activities. Okay, interesting. Now, now, thank you, Boris. And I wanted to ask Mikhail a little yeah, bit about now. Sense. We know uh, we know that there is a, a, a bug in this opal. How mm -hmm. did we figure out what kind of bug it is? Well, even before that, we were already wondering where the head was because um, in the first when the Brian first brought up this uh, stone, there was a lot of speculation on internet on what that that thing was in the uh, in the stone. So people came up with termites, I think, mm -hmm. or Ants. ants, even ants, but actually uh, without Boris's, the technology he put to actually uh, detect the difference in the surface of the insect and then soothe the shapes and really reconstru reconstruct the entire bug, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to actually know that what everyone was thinking was the head was actually the four legs of the insect. And this is, was a key feature in the insect to identify it, as well as the rostrum that was visible only through, what, what is it called, tomography? Yeah, X-ray tomography. Tom X-ray tomography. Without that, I mean, there was no way of being able to identify that insect through a microscope or anything else because of the opacity the opal had. So, so, that so one, one, you know, first time Boris showed me the tomography picture, it was a huge mess because the, the fossilization is so good that each individual hair on the cuticle of the insect is visible, is fossilized. So even each hair is fossilized to, to give you the, the kind of quality of the detail you can obtain through this fossil. So the whole thing was a big mess because this was all being seen through some X-ray X-rays. So then Boris went for a huge soothing of a shape and uh, I don't know what kind of uh, uh, programs he used. But anyway, once I could see, oh, these are actually the legs. And these kind of swollen forelegs are typical of cicadas pupa. So we were okay. really, and Boris actually did this in a very scientific way. And he hired me and another colleague uh, to I to blind blindly identify it, so I didn't know what she was thinking, and I and she didn't know what I was thinking, and we came up with the same. We concluded on the same um, uh, insect order and subfamily, and then to really confirm this, we had to go and actually ask a few specialists their own opinion on uh, on on the insect itself. Once we knew what what insect order we, were, we had in front of us. 
So that image that you're talking about, I think, is is figure three in your paper, yeah. and we have that um, <laughs> scan of that. Um, and so the 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 dark piece that that looks central in the in the opal when you look at it are those four legs that show up as orange here on this image here. And so that blue bit is the head, the red bit is the thorax where those legs exactly. are coming out of. Exactly. And then you have the abdomen. And so this was yeah. the scan that you did with the microtomography. So that's done yeah. with X-rays. X-ray. Yeah. It's, okay. like, it's like a scanner that like uh, for humans, just more, there is uh, very good resolutions for very small objects. But this but is exactly yeah. the same principle. This is a lot of work, bro. The, the <laughs> yes. initial yeah, image is half as, as nice as what you get here. Yeah. Well, don't you have to work. take... And it, and it was quite it was quite nerve wracking to uh, to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your specimen being put underneath that X-ray and yeah, Correct. yeah. <laughs> afraid that it might damage it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Mikhail, then you you had that identification. Um, mm -hmm. How did you figure out what stage of life it is? Because this looks to be one of the instars or which is one mm -hmm. of the molts of the sure. of the larva. How did you sure. figure out what part that was? So there were a few criteria that helped actually once we had nailed it uh, to being cicadas and we collaborated with one of the co-authors, uh, Chris Key, yeah. uh, who, uh, who, uh, who really helped on that. And one of the features, so you have between nine and 12 uh, different modes, yeah. pupils, stages in the cicada. And in the first three initial stages, there are no eyes apparent eyes in the in the pupa. It's completely blind. So the eyes only appear at the fourth or fifth inside. Mm. So this is one feature that helps to you know uh, and where you are in the in the stage of this insect. And uh, I think also with my colleague also worked a lot on the forelegs and you have a different development as the foreleg as you go on in the different stages of a uh, the pupa. Maybe something we should mention also is that this kind of insects completely spend maybe a whole year or two or up to 13 years uh, underground into, and feeding on, in, on basically sap from roots. So this is a very slow growing insect and it spends a lot of time underground, which is also an interesting aspect of finding fossils of this type of of really underground insects. It's, it's pretty rare, actually, I think. So um, I actually here in Georgia, we had an emergence of some of some cicadas um, mm -hmm. this summer. So a lot of people mm -hmm. are probably used to seeing the very last um, exoskeleton yeah. of these yeah, larvae yeah. which with the big eyes before they come out. Mm -hmm. um, but so you're so this was an earlier um, yeah. Um, yeah. Time period. So that's what's called an instar for all the viewers out there. Um, yeah. Now, one question that I just had come in is about when back when the X-ray was done on this opal. Was there a risk of that technique potentially modifying the color or anything of the opal? Oh uh, yeah, uh, this is a tricky question. Um, not on the opal itself, but we know that inside this type of opal, we can, you can have some inclusions of minerals and uh, specifically some uh, iron oxide or something like that. And uh, the opal is totally transparent to X-ray, so there is no problems with it. But with some inclusions and also with the organic matter that is contained inside, uh, we can just burn the organic matter with X-ray. So uh, we have been really careful to just do uh, small radiations um, to avoid any burning. Uh, so yeah, it can have some uh, change in the color, but uh, we have been really careful with that. And uh, most of the time, I don't see any uh, any change with X-ray and opal, in my knowledge. Okay, so so basically, the risk was other inclusions potentially uh, being affected, and the actual organic matter of the um, cicada. Now, exactly. looking at your paper, it says that the first thing that covered that cicada exoskeleton was some zeolite material. Yeah. Um, and what's the difference of that silica source from the source for the opal? Oh yeah, very interesting. 
uh, the, the, the zeolite, it's not a type of mineral that also uh, form inside the uh, soil or during the weathering of, uh, of the rocks. And this is also one of the evidence that this uh, opal come from the weathering and not the geothermal activity, like uh, the other questions you, you, you asked before. Um, this kind of zeolites uh, form during the early stage of, uh, of the soil development. Uh, because he, he at the first time, uh, no, at the beginning of uh, the wet wing, uh, you will just release a lot of uh, elements inside the water. So you will uh, release uh, silica, so it will be interesting for, for us after, but also aluminum, so also calcium and sodium and all of that. And uh, the first stage uh, will be to precipitate all these cations. And these cations will precipitate inside uh, the zeolites and after you will have a uh, huge excess of silica and this is this silica that will form the opal. So the zeolite, this is the first, uh, this is the first step of, uh, of the formations uh, of the fossil and uh, the sample uh, during the, the, the weathering of the rocks. Interesting. So um to go with that mentioning the zeolite forming and our discussion about the cicada, um, I want to pull up figure four um, from your mm -hmm. paper and see if there's anything else you all want to add on this story. So here um, we see, and if Jay, Brian has something to say, go ahead. While, while you pull that figure up, I just wanted to mention that. So to give the audience an idea, um, Boris and I had the the specimen inside that x-ray tomography inside the machine for I think like what, 16 hours or something like that? Um, yeah. So it's, it was quite a long time, and uh, hence the reason I said quite nerve wracking because, um, you know, we were just kind of like waiting, like what's going to happen is, you know, everything's going to be okay. And, you know, we did a lot of research on making sure that obviously the stone, you know, would be intact and everything would be okay. But, you know, there's always that risk. So, you know, it wasn't like a quick, you know, put it in a machine and it comes out, you know, it was. Uh, 16 hours and at the end you know during that that time period we had no idea um, if the scan would come out like if we'd have to do it again or you know what what the end result would be but um, the team I mean Boris put together uh, just the entire team they were just outstanding scientists I, I really I can't say enough you know I, like I said I'm not I'm not in the uh, I, my main background isn't in minerals. I, you know, I've dealt with some of the rarest and most expensive diamonds in the world, um, and brokered them. And but this was a, a whole different, uh, whole different uh, insect or animal, <laughs> the way the way you could put it. So um, yeah, it was uh, it was quite an experience using using that that kind of equipment to to do these scans. And you know, the the person who asked the question about the color, that's uh obviously was a main concern are we going to lose play of color or you know because that play of color inside the opal is um you know sort of not every opal has that play of color so to have you know this combination of things in a single stone it's just it's rem it's truly remarkable i mean um, but I just wanted to throw that in there about the machine so please continue oh. Boris I love oh. listening <laughs> No, no, no. You, 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 are, you have made a really good point, uh, Brian, with uh, with this because uh, you you really trust us with that because we don't have. This is uh, the first time that this kind of sample uh, come uh, come from my hands and also all the the, the scientific communities. So uh, this is the first try, and this this was a, a win. But uh, it was really interesting to have. Uh, this kind of uh, of stuff and to to really try and to have someone that is really interesting with the scientific part of the sample and that can trust us to go further on on the on this part. Uh, this is all, not all the people that have this kind of stones that want to just put inside an instrument like that uh, that can yeah we 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 didn't know before so we can have some uh, damage even if we make carefully it was. Uh, it was one uh, one of the danger. So um, it was really nice to work with someone that trust us with that to to do all all the scientific. So it's it's uh, all the team that was uh, that was 
We are grateful. Keep on. Yeah, grateful. Yeah. So I, I have figure four up here, which I think summarizes what we talked about with that life cycle of the cicada that you yeah. identified. Shows the zeolite in part B and then the opal forming in C. And I actually had a further question about this and maybe Brian can probably answer this. Um, the person wants to know um, who actually found the original opal specimen and how do they know that this inclusion was an insect inside there? How do they see it? Um, has this been has this specimen been polished or worked is another thing I want to add um, after that. So the original person who found the specimen is actually uh, uh, the miner is someone actually I actually know um, and they found it and they were going to polish it and they i guess they sort of made a rough form of it originally and that's when they saw something inside and were like you know what what is this inclusion and and you know it, how did this inclusion form so they contacted uh a dealer so they're you know obviously an indonesian uh uh gem miner and they have a mine there and um they contacted a dealer here in the United States who who acquired it and that dealer, um, you know, hence then contacted me just because uh, I'm known for, you know, obviously looking at uh, more interesting, you know, and rare uh, gemstones. So uh, it sort of was a chain of chain down the line. And, you know, once I had taken a look and uh, verified that it was genuine, I think the the next uh, tipping point for me was finding out more information. So um, hence the reason I went on the hunt to, to put together the right the right team of people. So. Well, thank you. And um, so with that, so that initial work that the that the miner did to kind of form that nothing else has been done since uh, on, yeah. on that specimen. No, no polish, no treatment, nothing at all. Um, and that, and that original, uh, I'm gonna call it a, a preform, I guess, is the is the right is the right terminology. Uh, that was lit particularly just to clean off the excess, uh, you know, material that was on the outside of the stone. So it really hasn't been uh, hasn't been polished or touched. You know, it's not it's not like a finished. Uh, gemstone that you would see, you know, per se in a in a piece of jewelry or or something like that. It's uh, opal in its rawest form. Oh, that so then um, that that small specimen that we see then is going to be more of the shape shape of the space at which this was preserved. Then so it also sure. gives us kind of geologic um, history of that internal vug or that that hole that it was in. Debatable. Yeah, I, I would say more. I would say Boris can probably uh, account for that a lot, a lot better than I can, because he's uh, much more uh, adapt to the the actual physical science of of the geology. You know, I focus primarily on the the gemstone part itself. So, but Boris could tell you, I'm sure, in extreme depth about uh, about how it was formed and the space that you know was there and and um, you know all, all about that kind of process. So I'll, I'll let Boris uh, jump in here. So yeah, on the shape of the sample, it's really like like Michael said, it's really debatable. Um, we don't really know why it's, it is in this shape and why the, the bug is this side. It's really difficult to know at this point because uh, since uh, the miner just uh, just uh, put the stone away of of the works that it's come from the horse work. It's really it's really difficult to have uh, much information exactly about the shape and all of that. So, as a scientist, I will say that we don't know, and we can imagine a lot of things. We can imagine that this kind of shape come from uh, an ancient roots that has been dissolved and not uh, the we can say that it's just a, a cavity that's come from the volcanic wars. We can say that it's a lot of kind of, um, of yeah, a lot of series. So on exactly the shape, it's really, really debatable. So yeah, let the imagination, let the imagination go. <laughs> So a question I have going forward with this specimen, what further science do you hope to do with it? <clears throat> we can do a lot of things. <laughs> well, something we can't do. 
uh, unfortunately, you can't do Jurassic Park. You can't, you know, suck the blood out, blood out of the fossil and and have that species back in. It was actually one of the downsides uh, of this was we yeah. couldn't. You can't extract any DNA to try and you know see when this species was present. If we, this is a new species uh, on Earth that had never been recorded before. All that was rendered uh, impossible for two reasons. First, we already mentioned this, that it's a it's a young instar, so it's first, second or third instar, so it's a very small um, you know, pupa or larvae juvenile. So you can't really do any identification, and DNA extraction is impossible on such old stones anyway. So there's no way of actually getting more information on the biological aspect of insect. Maybe on the opal, there's more to be done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on the opal and even on the organic matter uh, outside the, the DNA, as said by uh, Mika, uh, we can do more with uh, more powerful um, X-ray beam, uh, for example, in the sacrotron, we can identify which exactly which type of organic matter is inside. Uh, so the, this can be the other step. Uh, for me, as a geologist, one of the things that I really want to do uh, is to go on the field, to go, to go exactly uh, where uh, this sample has been found, and to really study uh, all of that. Um, the geological conditions that, that leads to the insect preservation, because this is the first time, so we need to understand what the physical and chemical conditions leads to that to really understand how it forms. And uh, no, we don't have all the funding to do that, but uh, we will try to. And, uh, and also, we can go further on the samples to date the sample. Maybe there is new ways to, to date this type of, um, of samples. And uh, also to really understand uh, what the physical conditions lead to, to this with uh, some geochemical analysis, for example. So there is a, the, the, the study we have done is only the first one, this is uh, a grand um, descriptions uh, of that, and we have a lot to do uh, to, to, to go more. We know that there is other samples that just uh, come, uh, come, uh, uh, come out from, uh, from Indonesia, so we, we know that there is uh, something else to study, so there is a lot of things now. Uh, this is just the start of something big. I think. One thing uh, Boris and I had talked about is uh, getting the funding, obviously, to to go into the field and and visit that mine site. So I've spoken, obviously, directly with the the miner who found, and you know, it's a it's a tricky subject because here's a miner who found, you know, a, a great stone and you know something that he did well on, and he doesn't. Part of him wants to know the science behind, and part of him doesn't want to, you know, give up his his secret space. So yeah. it's a right. it's a tricky quest, and I, you know, obviously, uh, it's something you, you know we'd all like to know more about. I feel like with this study, um, you know, and I, particularly probably with all gemstones, at least uh, at least for me, um, from what we know now, we're learning. We're still students, so. Um, <laughs> You know, I think that, you know, this, this study is to be continued and hopefully we can uh, get out into the field and, you know, get a better idea as far as the mine, the layout, you know, the surrounding area uh, and, and get a better idea of, of how it was formed. And maybe this will give us, like Boris and Mikael had mentioned, uh, a better insight to life formations on Mars. I mean, that's really, um, you know, and I think an important important part of the part of the uh, learning process here was you know how uh, how these how this life could be formed on Mars and there could be life records on Mars and that's uh, one of the reasons that um, I put together the team with Boris and Boris put together the the main team uh, because of that because of that factor so um, I think it's uh, like like I had said you know we're all still students. PhD, graduate gemologist, you know, we're still students, we're still still learning. 
<laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen, for sharing this cutting edge science with us. And we're grateful that here at TELUS, we actually get to have the specimen um, through March. So if anyone wants to come see Beverly the bug, the cicada that is in Opal, they can come to TELUS mm -hmm. Science Museum in Cartersville, Georgia and see the specimen. Um, and I think um, if I get any further questions from people online, we'll, we'll look on the live on the feed on Facebook and answer them um, in line there. And I'll get back with you on any of those questions, gentlemen. So thank you again for um, presenting here at our Lunch and Learn. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitations. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Ryan and the TELUS Museum. And thank you, Boris and Mikhail. Uh, it was an honor and a pleasure to uh, to, to be here with you guys. And um, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed. Have a great day. All right. Have a great day. See you. Bye-bye. See you. See you.